Uh, my question is, you've repeatedly said that you see many wonderful stock ideas, but can't invest because they're too small. Given that many in the audience today have a lower dollar investment threshold. <laughs> Do these stocks have names? <laughs> yeah. Well said. Well, the answer to that is that we don't look anymore. It, uh, we, we assume that there are a reasonable of number of opportunities as you work with smaller amounts of capital because it's always been true. I mean, it was over the years as I looked at things, uh, clearly you run into companies that are less followed as you get smaller and, and there's more chances for inefficiency when you're dealing with something where you can buy $100,000 worth of it in a month rather than $100 million. But that is not because I'm carrying around in my head the names of 25 companies that we could put 100,000 in. And I just don't look at that at that universe anymore. I sometimes people send me annual reports or uh, get letters from managers, and they they say, "Well, you know, I've got this wonderful thing." And I look. I I, I usually know ahead of time, but I mean, I would first look at the size, and if the size isn't isn't right and it isn't going to be virtually any time, I don't I don't look any further because it. There's just no time to be looking at at uh, at all kinds of smaller opportunities. I do think I do think if you're working with very small amounts of money, that uh, that there almost always are some significant inefficiency someplace uh, uh, to find things that uh, I've mentioned to some people. When I started out, I actually went through the all of the Moody's manuals and the Standard Poor's manuals page by page, and you could, and uh, you know it's, it's probably twenty thousand pages, but but. Uh, uh, there were a lot of things that popped out, and none of them were in any brokerage report or anything of the sort. They were just plain overlooked, and you had to you could you could find out about them, but nobody was going to tell you about them. Uh, and my guess is that that continues to be true, but not on anything like the scale it was then. Charlie, well, I can remember when you bought one membership in some duck club that had oil in under it when you were young. Yeah, a company uh, called I mean, you, when you get down to one Duck Club membership, well, you're really scavenging for cigar butts. <laughs> but uh, not a bad cigar butt. There were 98 shares outstanding. It was the Delta Duck Club, and the the Delta Duck Club was founded by 100 guys who put in 50 bucks each, except two fellows didn't pay. So there were only 98 shares outstanding. They bought a piece of land down in Louisiana and. One time somebody shot downward instead of upward, and oil and gas started spewing forth out of the ground. <laughs> so they renamed it Atlant, which is Delta spelled backwards, which was sort of illustrated the sophistication of this group. And, <laughs> and a few years later, they were taking, at $3 a barrel oil, they were taking about a million dollars a year in royalties out of the uh, place, and the stock was selling at $29,000 a share. And it was earning ten thousand dollars a share. No, it was earning about was earning about seven thousand dollars a share after tax, about eleven thousand pre-tax, and it had about twenty thousand a share in cash. And it was a long-lived field. So, you know, I use that sometimes as an example of efficient markets because somebody called me and offered me a share of it. And uh, uh, those things, you know, is 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 that an efficient market or not? You know, twenty-nine thousand for twenty thousand of cash plus. Eleven thousand of royalty income at twenty-five cent gas and three dollar oil. I don't think so. That uh, uh, you can find things out there. That, uh, I'll give you hunting rights on all my duck clubs in the future. Uh, 